Now we come to the last part of our tale and our fo focus shifts from the departed and much maligned Elspeth to Andrew Innes, who is often referred to as the last Buchanite. The holding of money in common between members led to prosperity for them even before Mother Buchan had left them. And that prosperity continued until the very last of the Buchanites passed away. During this time, there were more than a few attempts by unscrupulous types to join only to get access to that money. But Andrew was always more than canny enough to see them off. After Hugh White left them with his faction to settle in America, it was Andrew that led the remaining Buchanites while they waited for Elspeth's prophesied return. Andrew and the other remaining members soon moved to Larg Hill, near what is now Crockett Ford and then was simply known as Nine Mile Bar, where the toll was kept on the road between Dumfries and Castle Douglas. It was also the site of their next disappointment, for the spell of ten years that Elspeth had told them to wait came and went while they were there, although there's not much of a record as to how that went for them. They built the house at Larg Hill themselves, and once again a bed was built for Elspeth's body under the hearth, where the slow process of her mummification will have continued. As they awaited her return, they turned the bleak hillside at Larg Hill into a thriving working farm. The women were renowned spinners locally and were credited with bringing the two-handed spinning wheel to Galloway. They also became famous for their cures and skills in medicine, and local fo folk forgot their old animosity towards them. This might have been partly because the Buchanites did not charge for their services. Instead, they would tell people, she that has left us give us strict command to do all the good we could. We are but fellow mortals, give thanks to none but God. When the ten-year date came and went, all that changed was an end to the community of goods they had shared. The tenancy of Larg Hill went to George Kidd, one of the original members. The others were recompensed with a share of the crops and were paid for their work on his farm. They also began to keep their personal earnings from other work, like spinning or healing. When the lease at Larg Hill was not renewed, they bought a five-acre plot of land in close to the toll at Nine Mile Bar and built New House. They are credited with being largely responsible for the founding of the village of Crockettford, commemorated to this day in the street names Buchanite Court, New House Terrace and Elspeth Road. By the time they moved into New House, they had only 12 members left, including Andrew, Catherine Gardner and their child. The years began to pass and the only excitement that took place was when they had to drive away people drawn to them by their wealth. One by one, the Buchanites began to pass away, succumbing to time and old age. One had the temerity to ask for a minister on their deathbed, but Andrew forbade it. Eventually, only Kate and Andrew remained. Now, they had not lived as husband and wife in spite of the marriage that was forced on them, so perhaps there is an irony to them being the last two remaining. It was around this time that Joseph Train contacted Andrew and began the work of persuading him to give his account of the Buchanites. Their relationship was not always cordial, Andrew, having been previously scammed, never quite trusted Joseph. Still. He hoped on many occasions to persuade Joseph to become a Buchanite. Maybe he was encouraged by Joseph's keen interest in Elspeth and her followers, but Joseph's interest was purely as a historian. And it's thanks to their extensive correspondence and the lengthy notes that Andrew gave to him that we have such a detailed account of the Buchanites. And what of Elspeth's body at New House? Andrew had a secret chamber built inside Newhouse to keep it, above the front door, and this became his shrine to Elspeth. Her body was kept there in its coffin, at least until Elspeth's grandson, John Sanders, heard rumours that they were keeping the body at Crockettford and tried to take it. After that, Andrew moved it to a lean-to shed that was at the back of his own bedroom in Newhouse, then broke a hole through the wall from his room 
so that he could access it. Twice a day, he would heat an old blanket on the fire in his bedroom. Then he would roll it up and push it through the hole in his bedroom wall, wall onto Elspeth's coffin. After that, he would go into the shed and spread the blanket over Elspeth. He would pray a while with her before taking the gold blanket away to be warmed again. When he went to sleep at night, he would wrap that blanket around his head to help him commune with Elspeth's spirit. He told Joseph Train, I am left alone like a pelican in the wilderness, in appearance, but that is not really the case. I sleep every night in friend mother's house and breakfast with her family in the morning. Finally, 50 years elapsed since Elspeth's death and Andrew, alone now in his devotions as Kate no longer shared them, prepared for his friend mother's return. He lodged a large sum of money with a local banker. It would be too heavy to take with him when he was translated. As the day approached, the 29th of March, 1841, he grew outwardly excited and spent increasing amounts of time with Elspeth's body. He began to believe that he had been given this very long life just so that he could at last be reunited with her. What it was like for him on that fateful day while he waited for her return in the hiding place he had built for her is frankly unknowable, but the poor old man must have actually been devastated. Still, he believed it was he that was to blame. He obviously was not yet suitable for translation. Elspeth had promised. A short while afterwards, a local clergyman had the temerity to visit, hoping to bring Andrew back to mainstream religion, but he was thrown out of the house by Andrew in high dudgeon. Kate died sometime in September 1845, four years later. And her last words paint a very sad little picture of the last of the Buchanites. Oh, be careful of Andrew. He sits with his feet on the ribs of the grate, which has fashed me muckle. If the tunner soles at his clogs were to tuck fire, his feet and legs must be roasted afore he could shift in his chair. She was buried, like the Buchanites that went before her, in a small graveyard at the back of New House, probably where New House Terrace now runs. Andrew only outlived her by a little over three months, when he became ill after a fall. Just before he died, he made arrangements with three trusted locals for what was to happen to his body and to Elspeth's body. Circumstances forced him into confessing his secret, and he told them to bury her in the same grave, grave as himself, behind New House, with the others. Elspeth was to be buried first, then Andrew on top. If she awoke, she would wake Andrew up as well. He wanted her body to be removed discreetly at Cockcrow, so that no one else would know. Andrew died, sat in his armchair at the beginning of 1846. In a complete contradiction to his request, Elspeth's body was actually allowed to be examined by curious neighbours rather than secretly removed from New House. One of them described it to Joseph Train in detail, saying it had parchment-like skin. They also described it as still having some black hair attached at the back of the skull, missing its eyes, nose and feet and having skeletal arms and hands. Elspeth was still lowered into the grave first, according to Andrew's wishes, and Andrew himself was buried on top. The first and the last of the Buchanites forever together, still waiting for Elspeth's return.